So what's up, guys? We got the first episode of the Mental Breakdown podcast where I have an actual guest, and it's my great friend, Phil DeRue. We've done a bunch of work together, trained for years as professionals. We train as athletes together back in high school. Been a great journey doing this with you. But I want to talk more about the mental side of how you got to be where you are. We'll talk about some different themes and different topics and get to know you better and make it make sense. So cool. it, it seems like, you know, the roles are reversed a little bit right here. Right? Oh, yeah. Give him some insight. I'm usually on the other side of the table. And <laughs> yeah, so I, I first time for everything. Right. But let's get it. So how do we get here? We, we sent in Daru Strong performance, mm-hmm. uh, top facility in South. I'm going to say it the world. I'm biased. <laughs> yes. But how do we get here? Obviously, you work hard, yeah. you put in the effort. You was a former athlete. But what got you to this point? You said it, it's just hard work, you know, being diligent, being consistent, constantly in the pursuit of progressing, you know, learning, increasing value, putting yourself in the right positions and then capitalizing on those positions. You know, I think that the one thing is like I've been able to utilize the people that I've met. And then once, you know, people say who, you know, get you in the door, it's what you know that keeps you in the in the room. And so for that, allowing myself to understand that process helped me tremendously, you know, and then you got to be good. You got to be good at what you do. And so I think that me being able to connect with certain individuals, get the results necessary, and then improving on all aspects of not just coaching, but leading, you know, building businesses and and things of that nature. Have I done everything right? Absolutely not. There's been plenty of times where I failed. There's been plenty of times that I've done things wrong and I learned from those mistakes. That goes since I was a little kid, right? I've had you know, issues at home, issues from the law. Like I've had problems there. <laughs> we all ran into that. But the thing was, it never got me down. It never kept me down. And I was able to to learn and, and prosper from those situations, whether it be good or bad. So, you know, I'm big on mental toughness. You just said good or bad. Mm-hmm. And I tell it to our clients that we work with. I tell it to people I encounter in my classes. There should be no difference on how you perform. I'm sure you had days where you didn't feel like it or days where you're in the best mood. Did it differ on how you executed despite what you're going through? No, never. I think that that's the one thing is motivation isn't a real thing. I think it's discipline that really gets the job done because there's plenty of times, like you said, I don't want to do what I have to do, but I do it anyways because of that discipline that's built in. And that allows you to get the job done each and every day. It allows you to stay consistent. And I just talked about this off air. Like yesterday, I was Dead tired. Didn't want to go to jujitsu, but I knew that I had to do it because it is a part of the process. And that process at the end goal is to get my black belt, to solidify myself, to learn more. Even though I'm not feeling well, I have to go. I have to do it. And even if I just do the bare minimal, at least I showed up and got the job done. Now, with that being said, you want to always give a good effort. Of course. So whatever effort you can give at that particular time is going to be beneficial because it compounds over time. So I'd rather go there, do what I need to do, as opposed to missing the entire thing and then have to catch up. And that goes for everything, right? Mm-hmm. There's plenty of times where, I, where I'm waking up and I'm like, damn, man, I wish I could just stay home and chill, hey, right? Well, yeah, I've been there. But I've never done that. And if I did do that, I probably wouldn't feel comfortable. I feel like if you did that, you you would fit something work or something grind related in there. Absolutely. You would not do nothing at all. I'm always from working. what I know of you. Yeah, yeah. I'm always working. I'm always working. No matter what it is, it's work to me. Even right? if it's your kids, you're probably like, hey, Leo, uh, come here real quick. We you do like a set of something with him. And it's yeah. like, maybe I could do a kid's program. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm so, always thinking. It's funny. My, my boy always says, like, you're the type of person that, like, thinks of new shit in the shower. You know what I mean? Like, and you're probably the same way because yep, no. our mind's already going. <laughs> so, yeah, whenever I have free time, whenever, and I say free time as in just a little bit of time to myself without all this chaos going on around me, any quiet time is more of a reflection. It's also more of a thinking time for me to, you know, figure out what's the next steps, what's the next move. And I think everybody should have that. Now, don't get me wrong, you want to have some time in solitude because it does clear your mind and you could talk more about that in deeper detail. But for me, I allow myself to just basically shut the world off, go for a walk, get a little bit of cardiorespiratory endurance work, but also not listen and just kind of almost listen to my own voice in a sense. Mm -hmm. And it allows me to be clear. And then from there, again, I can push away all the clutter 
and allows my mind to be free for the next time that I need to utilize my mind in a higher manner. So before we started, you were talking about me getting back into doing what I used to do with performance psychology, performance coaching. And it's just interesting. Everything you just said plays into how I do it with my clients. I work with, you know, BSO, the sheriff's office, yeah. military, to all the way to kids. And it's like you mentioned how being to yourself and we talk about this like with type A personality mm -hmm. and like extroversion. And that's interesting you say that because you're definitely extroverted when it comes to handling business, social settings. But I know that you still want to be to yourself to handle yeah. stuff in the private. And that's something I feel a lot of people don't know how to toggle between. They think they either got to always be on it or always to themselves. And I feel in your success, you had to learn how to balance those out. Am I wrong? No, you're good. You got that on point. Like for me, I'm an introvert with an extroverted mindset, mm -hmm. right? So a type A mentality is why I got the shirts made. Yeah. On sale now, <laughs> DrewStrong.com. Exactly. Thank you. Keep that in there. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and and like, it's funny. We, ever since we met in high school, we connected, you know. It, it <laughs> That's just, a story in itself. <laughs> yeah, right. And for me, I was extroverted when I needed to be because I needed to lead. I needed to mm -hmm. um, inform. I needed to make sure that I was inspiring to those that were following me so i needed to be that extrovert but in, at the end of the day i like to spend time on my own you yes. know because it does allow me to grow and to learn about myself and that's important i think you got to know yourself before you can know other people you got to be able to master yourself before you can master anything else outside of your own self well that's interesting you say that because to get into like the science of it yeah. there was a study i don't know if you might have heard of this one where they surveyed extroversion, introversion, and intelligence. And it's not to say that one's smarter than the other, but it's more so that the people who are extroverted score higher, more on life satisfaction in the sense of they, they enjoy just doing whatever. Like you said, downtime is limited. And if it is, you're still working. But on the other side of the spectrum, the introverted people who are more so, I want to focus on goals, mm -hmm. thoughts, ideas, mm -hmm. tended to have the higher IQ score. So it's something to play off in thinking to your own life. Could you kind of say, because think about like this scenario, let's paint a scenario. I've seen you on parties. Like I know you had Tim's birthday a few months ago. Yeah. And it's like, I'm not saying this was you, but you probably were. Were you thinking in your head like, man, I, even if it wasn't related to working with whoever was there, it's like, yeah. I could have made a this or that. Like, do you think more so, you probably still enjoyed the moment, right? But do you think more so of like, hmm, what could I be creating right now though? I was more, yeah, it's so funny because that's an opportunity right mm -hmm. there. And a lot of times my wife gets on me about it. She's like, she's she's one that enjoys the moment where me, I'm always thinking about the next step. Mm -hmm. That's what and I mean. So yeah. Like if you look at my board back here, I know you guys can see it with the <laughs> video, but like it's filled with like goals and visions and, and, and everything that I have to do uh, the next steps to make it to where I want to go. And so I'm always constantly thinking about, you know, those particular steps. And even in a in a party, like you said, it's like, can I enjoy myself? Absolutely. Yeah, but there is times where I'm like, there's a, I don't want to say a motive, but there is a game plan. Of course. Right. So if I'm going to go talk to this individual, I'm going to come up with a game plan because I know that if I can connect, it's networking. If I can connect with a high level person, get them inside my circle. Well, now we just created more opportunities down the line for whatever may come my way. And that that's segue to another thought just coming in is like you mentioned out getting in the room, but being able to stay in the room. And like yeah. you said, you've been in a lot of circles where you weren't the most popular, the most smartest yeah. or fate, whatever it may be. Yeah. But like you said, you leverage that. And I can say the same because I, I, if we go back to 2017, when we like obviously we stayed in touch here and over, you know, how I go. But it's like yeah. I hit you up. I believe it was like a random Thursday. And you just said. Hey, I, I've been thinking about that too. And I got a guy named Dustin Poirier yeah. who I wanted to maybe bring something in like the Lomachenko stuff. And I, I ain't gonna lie, I didn't know who Lomachenko was. <laughs> and don't kill me for this. I didn't even know who Dustin was at the time because I didn't really follow MMA like <laughs> I gotta that. You got killed. You got to talk to Dustin about that one. <laughs> no, no, it, it's just <laughs> me not following the sport. Yeah, you know, you yeah, feel yeah. me? So it's like okay. when you brought me there, you didn't, t well, you told me, I think, the day of that Fox Sports was gonna be there. Yeah. And it's like, dang. So I'm meeting this guy. Yeah, that was last minute for me too, though. Oh, okay. And that's always usually how it goes for a lot of a lot of it. Um, I remember same thing with like, I don't mean to cut you off, but like nah. the same thing with Tyron Woodley. I I probably trained him twice. And then this, the second day that he came in, he's like, oh, I got UFC with me. So, I mean, there's it's just one of those things. But it was good because you capitalized on that exactly. situation. Exactly. I think you had a – didn't you have, like, a, a class you were teaching? Oh, you yeah. I literally class? canceled class in my <laughs> – I don't work for Barrett no more, but you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> I was just, it was one yeah. of those. But 
it goes to risk taking. Like, and I guess that's a point. What what would you say is the biggest business wise, the biggest risk you've taken that had a high probability or either not failure, but like difficulty or both? Uh, well, the I guess the biggest thing would be opening up the gym in the middle of the pandemic. Oh, yeah. Definitely. You know, I had no fear of it not working, you know, and it was almost I had no choice, you know, in a sense. I was capped out at a place that I was at before. Mm-hmm. And we so, yeah, so the goal was to progress. And if it was going to take me to take a big leap of faith, you know, trust in God and know that whatever I decide to do is already been written. You know, my my free will is still there if I want to go with it or not. But I decided to go with it because I do have trust in my abilities. I have trust in a higher power. And, yeah, I think that was the one thing I'm very fearless when it comes to making moves. And that's one thing that a lot of successful people, they have those attributes like they're not afraid to fail exactly. and they're definitely not afraid of success. So that's what halters a lot of people, not just the fear of failure, but the fear of success. I think that's good because to say this like this, because a lot of times you hear these these self-help gurus, I don't say any names, but they only talk about all you got to do is try and put in some work and you're going to be famous. Or you're going to be written is like they don't really talk about that part of like, hey, this was not the probably smartest thing to do. And the grand scheme of things, but if I didn't do it then, then when? Yeah. And people don't hear that side of things because they probably see you, Blue Checks, being Kevin James, Timberland, Dustin Poirier, and it's like, oh, he has it made. I'm sure you've gotten messed. I, I even got mad. I'm not as big as you, but I even got messed. You lucky, man. I'm like, look, <laughs> luck, yeah. I've gone to sleep almost luck, past man. 12 o'clock for the last decade. Yeah. I think people <laughs> just throw that out there because they want to be. Of course, yeah. So, like, luck. There's no hard feelings, yeah. Well, they try to make it seem like it was luck because they're not in a position that they that they want you well that they want to be in, right? Mm-hmm. So they say that oh, it's luck, or they you know, he just got this because of this, and a lot of times it's just their own insecurities coming yeah. out. And so, oh yes, Reaction. what I what I always tell people is like you know, listen, at the end of the day, you can do it too. It's just you got to follow these steps, but you got to know yourself. You got to know what your skills can be, what your God-given talent allows you to do. And then you got to work your ass off because you improve your skills from the talents that's been given to you. And then you utilize those skills in uh, any fashion necessary that's going to get you the highest reward. So you could you could work hard, but you could work hard at the wrong things. Yep. <laughs> and that and that could take you nowhere. <laughs> right you know, on the so treadmill, right? <laughs> well, yeah, it's like it's like uh, it's funny. I heard this uh this uh it was like people that cut grass with scissors. Like it'll get done, but it's a pair of scissors. You might as well do a lawnmower. It takes two years to cut. It a long time, right? So I heard that. That was funny to me, but it was it was interesting that it made a lot of sense because I see a lot of people that do that. They just work hard to work hard, and there's no direction. There's no guidance. There's no end goal. There's no vision. And there's really no goal setting. And like you might have a goal here and there, yeah, like, yeah, outcome. I want to – there's a there's a there's a short term outcome, but you should always have short, medium and long term exactly. goals that you need to hit on a constant basis to allow you to keep progressing and, and allow you to keep hungry. And a lot of times, like your people say, you know, follow your passion and all of that. Like when you're good at something, it becomes your passion. Exactly. So like like I started off fighting and I wasn't a coach at that time. But when I started to implement a lot of the strength training methods for myself and see that it worked. And then when I started working with my teammates and it started really working, I developed a passion for it Mm -hmm. because I was I was good at it. Like I got results. I could see that I had quantifiable data like it was there. Right. So there was no if, ands or buts. that This was something that I was going to take to the next level. And now after that, I'm like, well, can I coach this to other people and can other people benefit other coaches benefit from the methods that I've given them. And then I started seeing that go. So then I just started to develop a passion for coaching coaches. <laughs> nah, right? I've seen it. And that's that's a good game you just put people on because usually see people do the opposite. They'll do something they like just because they like it yeah. and try to turn that into a business, which can work. But it's like their whole their objective is like, since I love playing video games, I could be an esports champion. Yeah. Or if I love painting, I could be an artist versus you. You were tried and true. Like you said, it was quantifiable. It wasn't just the fact that you won fights, so you could increase your power, your bench, whatever yeah. squat. You showed it. And then you said, okay, now that I see this works, 
I can make it a business versus people just jump straight in the deep end. So like you said, take a risk, but it still has to be calculated, right? Always take calculated risk for sure. But I think that like when people go after like hobbies and shit like that, like definitely if it, if you enjoy it, go ahead, but don't think that you're going to mm-hmm. make, you know, millions and millions of dollars with it. Yep. I think at the end of the day, it's like, <laughs> what's the most lucrative, what's the most lucrative direction I can go? And then how good can I get at that? And then how far can I take it? And then know when your pivots are. Right. Exactly. So a lot of times people, they negate the pivot because they have nothing else. So like, I know a lot of people, a lot of successful people been able to maneuver their way, you know, own a business and then take it to the next direction and do and own multiple businesses after that because their platform was already set. Mm -hmm. They utilized, you know, their platform to catapult them to the next direction. And then from there, you look at like Jake Paul. Right. I know I want to bring this kid up. Hey, he's a, he's but a, if you look at it, what did he start with? Vine, YouTube. Now he's, you know, packing the house fights. with boxing. <laughs> but that's so in the other direction. But he took something that he knew that he could do very well. He's obviously athletic. He's young. He has a lot of money. He can utilize his circle to bring him the best coaches and everything else to help him. And he pivoted hard. And now he's making money doing that. It's not doing YouTube like that anymore. You see what I'm saying? Exactly. So it's mastering the pivot when the pivot is is time to come. So some very good business advice. It's a mental podcast, but that works too. Business minded. Yeah. So um, the segue is a topic I mentioned before we got into it. If it was okay to go, because I want to bring it up more so on the aspect of how mm-hmm. showing how I believe how mentally tough you are. Because I hold myself to a higher degree. Like yeah. like I'm I'm the type of guy like I may goof around, have fun, but. I'm, I'm a go-getter. I'll make things happen. Mm-hmm. So I look up to you as like, dang, this is a guy who makes me be like, I got to step my thing up. So mm-hmm. I remember, I don't remember the exact date. And you can correct me if the month's wrong, but mm-hmm. August 2019, there was an event we did in Stewart. And it was like a kid's affair, I believe. And your son was there, a bunch of other kids. We were doing, me and you were running the uh, activities. Yeah. And it was a fun event. We did some physical stuff. I think we did like a tug of war, a foot race, the fit lights. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was a great time, family, friends, fun, connecting. And I was sitting right next to you oh. and you got a call. And like, when you hung up, I could see the mood change. And it's like, like it's not, it's not even my family, but it's like when I heard like what you told me about your mother passed. Yeah. It's like, whoa. Yeah. And the thing is, we were in the middle of that event and you still finished up. Your, I believe your wife went to go handle things. And as soon as you got a chance, you left and then I finished it up and, and closed it out. But it's like, like obviously, I thought you was a strong person. I've known you, what, 2006? So yeah. 15, 16 years now. So mm-hmm. half my life, half our lives, the same uh, age, same birth month. Mm-hmm. And it's like, obviously, I knew that, but that was like, whoa, because yeah. I know. I think three, two months prior, your, your father passed. Yeah, yeah. And then, like you said, that was real sudden. Yeah. Two back to back. One, remember the scene from, but not even to go off top with Coach Boone on Remember the Titans? Mm-hmm. And it's a very similar story. And it's like, I, like not say your life is a, a biopic, but hey, maybe you'll get one. Tom Hardy, right? That's yeah, what we said. Tom Hardy. <laughs> Tom Hardy's the man. <laughs> but yeah, so Tom Hardy, if you're watching, yeah. <laughs> you got to roll for you. But basically, it's like, not only from that day and that moment, I saw how you held together because you had to be strong for your mom. I mean, your own wife, kids. And then after that, like I said, the pandemic, all that happened literally months after. So this wasn't like you had time to grieve, time to really catch up. You just had to. Obviously, I know you had to deal with it, but it's like you made it happen. So what? what is like what goes into that? I know it's not necessarily something you can teach necessarily, but what was no, going through your head? I've always uh, been able to still carry on the task no matter the situation no matter what's going on around me um i guess you could call it stoic in a lot of ways where i'm I'm just kind of even i don't get too high i don't get too low um when i know a job has to get done no matter the situation no matter what else is going on around the world i need to get that job done first and foremost so i think that that's one thing another thing is that uh, always being prepared for the worst you know, but but staying positive at the same time. So I was always prepared. And even though my dad passed was even more sudden, you know, my mother, I knew that she was sick. She was she's been sick for years before that. And so it was one of those things where we kind of knew that it was time was coming. Obviously, I was in the middle of something 
And at that point, I'm not going to just stop what I'm doing. Um, now, if it was an emergency or something like that, then obviously I would have left. Um, but it was uh, it was already kind of written. So I think just in, in a from a mentality standpoint is just making sure that you stay even no matter what the situation is. You stay on point. You stay professional. You know, um, don't let your emotions take over. And I think that that's what differentiates. And I don't want to, you know cause an issue with females, but I think that that's what differentiates males uh, from females. I, I agree. There's, you know, there, definitely. there's definitely emotionally driven. Well, my wife is the same way. I love my wife. Yeah. You know, obviously, but you know, she's, she's emotionally driven at times. Maureen, my assistant, <laughs> she's two time world champion boxer, but she's emotionally driven at times. It is just their nature uh, for males. We have to stay even just to maintain that level of balance when it comes down to, you know, heartache when it comes down to joy, whatever the case may be, we have to be that beacon of strength in order for us to maintain that progression, no matter the situation. Yeah. So that makes me think of something I used to teach at Broward and you've actually guest lectured at my class a few times, but basically it's called the five stages of grief. And after that happened, how I taught it changed because it's actually not even based on a psychologist. It, so it's more so I forget the lady who came up with it, it was a self-help author. Mm-hmm. But basically the stages were um, anger, denial, uh, bargaining, uh, depression and acceptance. Mm-hmm. So each stage, you know, anger, you're mad. Why did this happen? Uh, denial. No, it can't be uh, bargaining. Please take me instead. Uh, depression. You don't want to go nowhere. You're down. And then acceptance is done. So after that happened that day. I started changing how I taught that lesson because it showed that it's not linear. Cause a lot of people say, oh, you gotta go through the five stages. Like, no, yeah. you can be at acceptance day one because like you said, your mindset was already True. there. You yeah. were prepared. Cause it's a it's a crappy thing to talk. Like our parents were same age. So it's like, we were getting at that age where that's a very realistic thing now. You know, I have numerous yeah. friends, sadly, one of my other close friends, uh, his dad passed. I think a year after that in my, one of my other friends from high school. So it's like, this is real like stuff now and just getting through that. So it's like, be able to see that, that like, like I said, you impact me on camera. Like you impact me more than I think you think you do. But um, to wrap up, I want to finish with one more thing. Cause like, I know that's a heavy topic, but um, with the fits aspect, you brought up stress, you brought up like how it impacts you day to day, having time for yourself. And you mentioned off camera about overcoming injuries and you brought up how stress played a big role on yeah. what even led to you getting injured and could you elaborate on maybe not just what happened but like the science of that because i know you're big on well, understanding cortisol and all the different things that go on with that well i started to understand like and, and as a coach you need to know like fatigue management it's a big thing right so like an overabundance of cortisol which is your stress hormone and you know about this an overabundance of that if you go too far on that spectrum of always stressed out, always go, 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 always fight or flight, which is your fight or flight response, which is the sympathetic nervous system. That kicks in when you are stressed out, when you're doing physical activity. And I was constantly going. So no matter what, I was burning the candle at both ends, right? So whether it be physical stress, mental stress, emotional stress, whatever have you. And so the accumulation of that stress or cortisol started to diminish a lot of my function in a sense, right? And the structure of my body. So when I would go, even though mentally I would push myself, I would end up pushing myself too hard and then end up getting these nagging injuries, whether it be high levels of inflammation, which is also brought on by cortisol. And then also um, lethargy, you know, brain fog, things like that, all comes from that overabundance. Less less sleep, uh, under eating, yeah, right? Because you're constantly <laughs> going. So all these things play a role. And when that happens, your body starts to break down. You either get sick or you get injured. And that and that's pretty much what happens. So I had to, with that in that particular aspect, I had to find out a way to maneuver my body, maneuver my mind, get myself in a place where I was able to still progress without hindering myself. So taking supplements, you know, making sure that I was bringing down the cortisol. I wasn't training as hard or as often. I wasn't training with the high high amounts of volume. So that helped. Bringing up my calories definitely did help too as well. Uh, t- taking out some of the stimulants. So I went off of caffeine for like a full week and a half, which was 
hard to do, <laughs> I know. right? Because we, we take it right now. <laughs> yeah, right. So getting off of that allowed it to get back to a better stage. And there's several stages of, of cortisol and this will be a whole podcast. Yeah, so <laughs> we definitely could, but that final stage is where, you know, people, some people say like adrenal fatigue, I know that's not a real thing, but your adrenals can be so suppressed. And so I guess not non-functioning that you end up getting those symptoms of inflammation, of sleepless nights, uh, brain fog, being tired in the morning, things like that. And so you have to flip it. Right. You have to make sure that you're doing those other things to combat that. And that means getting more sleep, getting more uh, calories in you. Right. In the form of either whether it be carbohydrates, something that's going to give you energy, taking away the stimulants that's suppressing that 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 tired feeling, basically, because it's just masking. It. It's not helping mm -hmm. you get more energy. Nope. Right. <laughs> People don't understand that. Yep. Uh, low intensity training to help you with more mitochondrial density, increase in ATP or energy. And then also bringing your body back down to a parasympathetic state, right? That rest, digest state. And so all those things will help you down the line. That's what I had to do in order for me to not get injured again. Obviously, I had to bounce back from injuries, doing rehab, prehab type stuff. And then being mindful of all those other things, right? Being mindful of the mental stress, being mindful of the physical stress, making sure that I schedule out appropriately, still allowing myself to get what I need to get done, but not overdoing it to the point of where I injure myself. So you just gave me a light bulb moment, just like we were talking about how you're in your head thinking of the next idea. This could be a possible program. You hear it here first. The physiology of mental toughness, because how you were describing that, because we talk about mental toughness in my field with psychology, like you said, the mental side, yeah, yeah. that's the thought process of how do I reconfigure when things don't go my way? How do I bounce back from failure or loss? How do I know when I don't have the abilities and regroup? That's what mental toughness is about on the psychological. But then you start describing dialing back the loads of your physical stress, whether it be training, whether it be getting enough sleep, nutrition. And I could be wrong. I know it's, it's obviously a topic in the literature, but I don't know if it's been approached like that. So what do you think? You might have something there. I like it. Um, like anything, a method to actually building mental toughness from both spectrums. Because obviously the site world got the, the the typical stuff, but looking at it as well, a program it, from both sides. I believe that you can develop it, but I also think that it's 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 kind of in you already. Of course, there's levels to it, definitely. And I think that it can be enhanced through yes. certain situations, mm -hmm. going through certain circumstances that allows your mind to be calloused, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody has it in them. It's just how well they will yeah. pull it out of them. Cause you but can't yeah, make people done. like go I through can make it happen. tough, no tough times. Obviously. Like I had a client who I do performance coaching yeah. and cognitive conditioning. Yeah. And they're like, how do you make them mentally tougher? And I kept a G with them. I'm like, well, you came from a, uh, they're from Jamaica. Yeah. You came from a hard life. He said it like, I know the struggle, but they, they live in decent area. Like they don't know that struggle. So yeah. and it's good. You don't want you, we both have kids. You don't want your kids to go through what you went through, yeah. but there's a balance of like, they need to have some. So it's like, we can't say, hey, we're going to leave you in the worst neighborhood for two months. Figure it out. Like, obviously, you'll figure out some things, but yeah. that's not good parenting. Yeah. So going back to the point is like making at least a feasible way to increase it because it can be enhanced. Like you said, it's good in doses. I think you should mm -hmm. dose some type of adversity. Exactly. No matter what mm -hmm. it is. You know, I do that with my kids, too. It's like, yeah, I can see when they start to get a little bit more like, <laughs> oh, OK. Betty. Yeah. I'm like, all right. <laughs> Now you're going to do this, you know, so it's more of like dosing it accordingly, just like anything. really. Mm -hmm. All right. So before we uh, wrap it up, you want to give your information for those who may not know where to find you. No doubt. Uh, Even though they probably do because they follow me. <laughs> uh, Instagram and my Twitter is at Daru Strong. So you can follow me there with all the information I put out on there. And then my YouTube channel is Phil Daru Strong. Website DaruStrong.com. Very simple. Uh, all my programs, my mentorship, all that stuff's on there, too. So check it out. So I appreciate you coming on, man. Thanks for watching and thanks for letting us break it down and get your mind right.